Yes, um, it's now recording. Thank you for joining us for the last Inspire student of the semester of the actually academic year. Thank you for joining us on all of them. And thank you to all the panelists, all the alumni who have graced us with their presence and to all four of you today. Um, again, as you all know, Inspire Students is a partnership between Alumni Office, Career Services, and PDC. Aline is here. She's going to be moderating the panel. And um, just as a reminder, this video and all the other ones are available on YouTube, and you can use the Q&A um, function to ask your questions in French or in English. That will be for the last portion. I'm going to introduce our alumna and alumnus, and then we'll go straight to the to the panel part. First, we have Hans Baumgarten, who did the MIA program and graduated in 2009. He has been with the UNDP in Paraguay for five plus years and is currently the private sector and sustainable development specialist responsible for engagement with the private sector. Before this current post, he was a project coordinator managing a diverse portfolio of developmental projects. Um, after his studies, he was an assistant economic officer at UNCTAD, after which he interned to the, at the WTO for five months. He then returned to UNCTAD as a consultant economist, uh, where he worked on investment policy reviews for development countries. We also have Joanna Galvez Reyes, who completed her MDEF program in 2019, and she's currently associate policy officer at IOM, where she has been for the past two years. Prior to this position, she was first an intern in the multilateral processes division and then a consultant working on IOM's relationship with UN agencies and the UN system as a whole. Before joining IOM, she interned at the Treaties Bodies Branch at the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights. And prior to her time at the Institute, she worked at CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America, for almost two years and also taught at the Universidad Central de Venezuela. Then we have William Knetsche, who did his MIRPS program and graduated in 2015. He's data manager at the United Nations Scaling Up Nutrition Movement Secretariat, supporting governments and their stakeholders to track public financing for food security and nutrition. In this capacity, William has coordinated the program by coaching government focal points and managing consultants to assist countries in relevant training and completing their financial tracking exercises. Previously, he was an assistant to the permanent representative of Panama to the United Nations, a data analyst at the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime in Mexico, and a human rights officer with migrant workers in Canada. Last but not least, we have Carola Saleta, who graduated from the LLM program in 2020, and she's currently a legal fellow at UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, where she has been since February of this year. Prior to this position, and right after graduating from the Institute, she was an intern at the Special Procedures Branch at the Office of the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights um, in Geneva. And before her LLM studies, she had also worked with the UNHCR in Rome as a legal intern and then as a protection assistant. Her areas of specializations include refugee protection, international human rights, and migration law. Thank you all so much for being here for this United Nations focused Inspire students, which has attracted many students evidently. And now I'm gonna give the floor to Alice, Aline, who is going to take the panel forward. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here today. It's an honor to be moderating this uh, session, this round table. Um, so the first question I would have for you all is whether you came to Geneva already with a dream to work for the UN. So I don't know, Hans, if you can answer yeah. this question. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Hans. I'm from Paraguay, as mentioned. Thank you, Lynn, for the question. Um, yes, but uh, short answer is yes. I, I already had a dream to work for the UN before coming to Geneva. I had the opportunity to do an internship with the power admission to the UN in New York. And I think that did it for me when I had that opportunity and I saw that I knew I wanted to be involved professionally in the UN world. So, yeah, that opened my eyes. Okay, thank you. And you, Juana? Juana? Thank you. Uh, first, but, uh, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very, very happy and pleased to be here and honored as well. Um, yes, in my case, the same. I am. Um, I, I dream to come to, to the UN right before coming to Geneva, but quite honestly, I wasn't sure exactly which organization. So I just wanted to be part of that big family. And here during my studies was when I defined my, my path within the system. Thank you. William? 
Is it the same for you? Well, it'll take me a quick one minute to give you the play by play. Uh, <clears throat> I had been accepted to six schools, three of them with full rides. And I, when I w received the acceptance, which was the last of the six to IHID, I love the, the opportunity of a two year program. There was a chance for an, ex an exchange, the ability to learn languages. And I firmly believe that being in a place uh, where there's a lot of opportunities, internships and jobs that will come up was really smart. So it was also very difficult. And as students would know, being able to come, being able to afford it, working in summers and things, it was always a lot of effort. And you're always figuring out a master's trying to go to the next thing. So while it was a dream, I never thought it was attainable until I had got to Geneva and started shaking trees and applications slowly came my way. I didn't believe it at first. And well, the way the cards fell, it happened that way. Wow, thank you. And you, Carola? Um, hi, hello, everyone. Um, I'm also very happy to be here today. Um, so my answer is actually yes, but. And now I explain why, of course, and um, I say yes, because after getting that first experience with UNACR in Rome, I, I felt that was my calling. That was what I wanted to do and a dream worth chasing. Uh, but I also add, but because, you know, I only had that one single experience in one single country office and I knew the UN workspace was heterogeneous in, in the wider sense and, and the actual work my differ between, you know, different agencies and offices. So in a sense, I was all in without knowing the cards yet. Um, but beside all this, um, I chose to specialize in public international law at the Graduate Institute with the dream of working for the UN in mind. Yet, I have to say, it became real the very moment I arrived in Geneva and I was able to experience that old headquarter city vibe. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so um, Hans, um, I would like to start by asking you this, uh, this question. Um, I often have students telling me how they feel reluctant to take on short term uh, contracts at the UN or internships. And I was hoping that you can share with us your experience um, of uh, those contracts and if you had to challenge if you had any challenges uh, with certain employment rules. Hey, um, let me put it this way. I think that um, there's a big trade off working for the UN or having a career in the UN, and the trade off is the following. On the positive side, you're working for something you're passionate about. You think you feel like if you're lucky in the position you're working, you feel like you're making a difference in the world. Uh, and the negative side, the big trade off is job security. I think that the golden age of being an international civil servant and having a stable uh, job until you basically until you retire, if those days are gone. Um, I think that more and more we see um, different modalities, and there be changes in the type of modalities contracts you get at the UN, and we're tending to have more of this short-term uh, consultant type of work. So I understand uh, it, it's, it's a big challenge. I would say that just to get in in the beginning. And I understand also the frustration because I've gone through that myself of um, living from like six month contract to a yearly contract and not knowing if that's going to be renewed or not. Um, so, yes, it's a bit of an uphill battle. Um, and I, I think the takeaway, if, if I can give one today to everyone listening to the students, is um, if that's really your dream to work in the UN, don't give up. Don't be discouraged by that. Um, you will see that there's other opportunities will, will show up um, as you go along. And also you have to be ready and um, accepting that there might be not a study plan or, or not a study career path for you. Uh, you're gonna have to take some opportunities as they come. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier was my stint at WTO, I did that for five months. The reason why I took the job, it was precisely because I changed the rules and I had to make a break of service with the UN. Uh, for at least six months, and that's what I did. I was lucky enough to be able to uh, take an internship at the DOTO for the for that time period until I, could, I was able to go back to the team I was working uh, in the UN. So yeah, this, um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of rules you have to navigate through. Um, sometimes you you might have regulation with hiring manager, but there's the HR and the rules um, that you know apply to everyone, and maybe you cannot. Um, to navigate that. So 
it's a, it's a bit of a struggle. Um, but if 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 you really have this dream to work at the UN, and and I I, I finally personally I find it as being very satisfying. Uh, we encourage you to continue on that. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, now, Joanna, um, I've seen that you have been able to do two internships during your studies at the Institute, uh, one at the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights and another one at IOM. And I was wondering if you could explain to us um, um, how you find these opportunities. Of course, well, I have to say I was very blessed uh, to meet the people that I applied for the internship in the career fair in, in the Institute. I remember that they had all these tables and then you have to go and put your email in the depending on the topic that you were that you were interested in. And in that case, uh, it, it was how I met the people from OHHR. And I remember I said I, I wrote down my, my email, but I wasn't sure if it would really happen or not. And then on another important thing is that I continue to follow up. I may also have to explain that I had an internship that I got accepted, but I couldn't take because I was already a student, so I, I couldn't take it like full time. And when I have to reject that uh, position, I cried and it was like, oh, no, it's like, imagine the first time that they're calling me and I'm rejecting that. This is the one chance that I have. And it's not true. And we can, the, 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 the better thing to do is continue applying and checking for really things that you're interested in. So in the case of OHHR, it was through the career service. In the case of, of IOM, was through the IOM job portal. And a recommendation that I would uh, give to other students is to really continue checking those websites. And even you can set an alarm system. So when one opportunity appears that is from your interest, they will automatically send you an email and work really hard for your motivation letter. So those are my, my suggestions. Thank you so much, Joanna. Very good advice. Um, now, William, um, we have a workshop called Care of Planning, and um, basically we want the students to understand, I mean, to see their career as an exploration. Um, so in lines with what Hans was saying, actually, um, rather than a goal to achieve, uh, basically because we can gain from uh, any experience and be exposed to new and unexpected uh, great opportunities. Um, you clearly have a diverse experience uh, as you have worked in so many different topics. Um, I've seen that you have worked in migration issues, uh, Chinese energy companies, uh, public safety and victimization, uh, human rights, terrorism and drug trafficking, and now you work in nutrition. So um, some of our students are worried uh, that if they do not specialize, they would not be attractive for the UN. Would you like to share any advice to them? Absolutely. Uh, I would say you should aspire to be a jack of all trades and master of none. Uh, I have tried, especially coming out of the Graduate Institute, the thesis was organized crime, illicit economies, went to Mexico for that, worked with the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, got to publish two things in Spanish about criminal networks and how they communicate. Everything said Zach. You're going to work with organized crime. And then I got in, involved with nutrition related financing. The motivation letter I threw together was that since I'm working with illicit economies and hidden money, I'll probably be okay helping governments find things they're looking for. And that piece of being transferable, uh, my recommendation to you is very simple. Don't be worried. You're looking at entrance level jobs. Go for things you care about. Go for things that you've never heard of as well. I did not study development. I was in war and conflict with organized crime. Now I support governments in nutrition. At this point in my life, I am trying now to figure out I've stumbled into being an expert in something. There's only two or three people in the world supporting governments in the way that I am now. I don't want to be an expert in that way because experts box and say, well, you go this way. And so you step back and now since I've been nutrition, I'm looking at food security, world hunger and making a transition. But you always want to take what you've learned and understand that it's not going to lead you directly to your next job. Your career is not going to go like this. It is going to change and you need to be ready for that. And I believe that your master's really sets you up to be comfortable not knowing things and learning and learning how to learn. So with those skills, you're going to be OK to adapt and improvise. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much. That's really uh, what I was hoping for. <laughs> now, Carola, I have a question for you. Uh, I saw that before coming to the Institute, you already had a master in law. Uh, and you had already worked uh, at the UNHCR. So um, I was wondering what would, uh, what made you decide to go for an LLM? So before I answer the actual question, I shall say, yes, I obtained a master in law in 2018 as the final step of an enriching um, academic experience at the University of Turin. Uh, yet, and this might sound bizarre, reconnecting a bit to what um, William said, um, I did not decide to study law to practice law in Italy. Okay. <laughs> um, I really decided to study law uh, because of my early interest in human rights and justice issues. And this general idea I had back then as a young a youngster uh, to work for the UN. Um, looking back at it now, I see that master in law as actually the launching pad to reach the international space. Uh, so, having said so, uh, circumstances were completely different when I chose to go for an LLM in, later in 2019. Um, that internship with UNACR uh, provided me with the opportunity to do substantial work in the UN and get exposed to a wide range of international and protection related issue while also being fully merged in a multicultural environment and workspace. And, you know, um, that was like a taste of what it's like to work for the UN, but also what it takes to do so. And in fact, um, uh, while I was trying to learn things and understand dynamics as fast as I could, uh, I felt the exposure that I got to international affairs and international law at the University of Turin was just not going to be enough for that career. Uh, so that has swelled my desire to sign up for an LLM to do that to myself. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but um, I realized that an LLM degree uh, in an institution like the Graduate Institute, like a prestigious institution like that, would uh, really be the chance to enrich my knowledge, but also professionally grow um, and like start a career in the international legal sector. Um, from my personal experience, um, I would highly recommend to, I guess, international law students that are tuned in today to choose a program that actually gives you both a firm grounding in international law, but also advanced training in specific area of interest, which could be human rights, investment law, trade law, whatever you can think of. Um, this is extremely important in reconnecting to what uh, William said about uh, Zach, well, <laughs> to what um, uh, generalist versus specialist uh, kind of like dynamics in the UN. So find your own way uh, and that will work out. Uh, last, I would like to say, um, you know, the LLM, like, like all their postgraduate programs, is also a unique opportunity to actually meet your future colleagues. And I say future colleagues because like when you come together in an academic program, you come together with people that have the same interest and probably similar aspiration. Like in my LLM cohort, there were like people for both the public, the private sector, diplomats, <laughs> like for like a human rights defender for prominent NGOs. So you really get those connections that will be priceless in the future. And I would like to conclude, I promise I'm concluding. Uh, um, uh, LLM programs can be extremely expensive. And I'm sure there are students today tuning in that might wonder whether that's worth it. Um, you know, uh, it is an investment for the future. And I think it really is. Uh, but the best piece of advice that I can give is that before going on that journey, <laughs> just be motivated, like highly motivated, and just be sure that you're ready to commit to such a new ambitious challenge. Because, you know, an LLM is usually like a huge burden and investment on families, but overall is a personal commitment. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Uh, Hans. I have another question for you. Um, I've seen that you hold a bachelor degree in economics and political science, and then a master in international affairs. Um, you studied your career at UNECTAD doing economic research. Then you went to the WTO, then came back to UNECTAD as a consultant economist. And I was wondering which degree helped you the most uh, to secure those jobs. 
Uh, yes, well, I would have to say that my economic background, so my economic degree was most helpful for the UNCTAD position. Um, I, I began actually doing an internship for UNCTAD where I was looking into the investment policy and I was in, responsible for doing research on foreign direct investment. Um, so a lot of data on that, the trends on that. And that's how I began my, my work with them. So once I graduated from HAE, um, then I started, I started working with, well, not the team I interned for, but another team that was doing also investment policy. And that's how I, I got involved and grew um, on that. Um, but I would say, obviously, the whole, the whole of um, academic um, backgrounds and everything that you carry will come useful to you at some point. Um, just to mention, in terms of the political science degree I got, I, I later do more work on that when I moved to Paraguay back home, working for UNDP. And I think one of the advantage I can say, what I appreciate about the MIA degree uh, that she offers is this interdisciplinary approach where you can, you know, kind of pick and choose from different um, um, academic areas. And then you, I think you become more, more rounded and professional in that sense. Um, um, working for UNCTAD, although I was using mostly the, the economics background, for example, I, I, I ended up also writing the investment policy reviews for countries, and that also would entail reviewing um, the norms, uh, regulatory framework, and then a lot of legal things, let's say, that it's not, not, it's not my background, but um, as you become a bit of an expert, it's going to be using the willing the work, well, as you become a bit of an expert in an area, uh, you also learn that you have to like um, look into other things that Maybe it wasn't your first, um, it's not your first academic background, let's say. Okay, thank you so much. Johanna, uh, my last question to you is, um, I've seen that you volunteered many times in the field of migration during and after your studies. Um, and I was wondering if those uh, volunteering experience, experiences, I'm sorry, uh, contributed to where you are today uh, in your career. The answer will be yes and no, because I have to carry by that three or four of the volunteers experience that I, I have, uh, I did in the same organization while I was working with them. So um, I really needed to also have that sense of pertinence of the organization and understand and meet other colleagues and know what the other parts of the house were doing. So in the case of IOM, for example, I volunteered for the International Dialogue on Migration. Um, and in in CAF, I even volunteered for the marathon. So it was really just to to, to meet my my colleagues and, and be more part of the family. I was fortunate enough, though, to have the, the scholarship in the institute that also allowed me to take those opportunities, although we're unpaid. And I think that also connect with the question of the internship. So maybe uh, students have questions uh, regarding to that. I have to say, I also had another um, volunteer with the GFMD, which is the Global Forum for Migration and Development, and that one was a paid one. And in my case, it was a really good experience just to meet other people, to, to have a little bit of a taste on how migration was being discussed in the international forum. And uh, right now, well, I have colleagues that work there, so it ended up very well. So I think it will depend on people if they in, in us in, if we you like to use the volunteer work to me to feel the taste of the the, the topic that you're interested in is perfect. Of course, it, it can also lead to opportunities, but I will dwell more for for the interest of being part of them. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Zach, I get your name right now. <laughs> Um, networking is a big part of job searching and um, it's a long term process um, that can scare many students uh, who doesn't, who don't really know how to approach it. Um, and I wanted to know if um, you could share any example um, where um, networking uh, helped you build a career in IOs. Well, it first starts with names. Uh, it's important that you remember people's names. Uh, I'm horrible with names. My first name is William, and people who know me would call me by my middle name, Zach. And since we have to be re real with each other here, it's best that you refer to me as Zach. So networking. I'd like to give you uh, an example to think about before you found a job, what to do in the application process, and what to do once you get the job. I wish that there was a magic bullet to get your application noticed. 
you are competing against algorithms and other people. The humbling aspect is you don't have to be the best at this stage. You just have to be good enough for them to say, we want to interview you. How do you network at this stage? I don't care if you're best friends with the guy's chief of mission. You're probably not going to get noticed that way. But rather than think of how do you network, how can you be a networker? You need to be there supporting your friends in the institute and elsewhere, making their applications, cover letters and the, the rank and file CV better so that they are placed. That will help you when you apply too. It will be by chance and fate that you go through your first stage of an application. And this is where real networking comes in. You want to demystify, if you go networking to communicate with people so they can get you a job, you'll be seen as fake, they'll see through it, and no one will help you. But once you're there to help other people, I like to go out and party. I usually don't talk business with anyone for, for a couple times of meeting them. And then once a relationship is formed, usually I'm the one connecting them with a friend. But once you have went through the stage of saying, okay, I have an interview, what should you do? First, contact career services at IHEID. They will support you in interview prep. There's a science behind it and it's messy. You also want to use things like LinkedIn. There's no shame in the world of saying, okay, this is the uh, division of this agency. Message people in that agency. They're going to, some people will meet you. They'll tell you a bit about it. That will help you so much. I do this. I just did it and it worked. That's a spoiler alert. <laughs> but you really want to connect with people that are involved in the organization to help you prepare for the interview. Look to be, a mentor to other people. Understand that when you approach the interview stage, uh, there is a science behind it. And don't be afraid of things called competency-based interviews and stuff. Speak to people that have that experience and they're gonna give you the guidance you need to keep learning. You've made it through a master's, you can figure out how to pass a competency-based interview. Finally, what do you do once you're in an organization? To make sure that uh, the saying, the best light comes from a burning bridge, you don't wanna burn bridges when you're inside of a place. So what do you do? I say to myself when I'm in a new place, you're in a boat and everybody here is your boat. You probably have a captain. If not, it's anarchy, but you're in a boat. You need to be real. If you were fake and opportunistic, they'll see through it. Don't be afraid of making mistakes, but understand that you're on a boat and you will be judged and people will take those judgments with you. You will have friends. You will have people that for one reason or another are not your biggest fan. Try to be able to tell the difference between those two. Always support your friends in their applications. When you get a job coming back through the network at the Institute, you're gonna find out that somebody you were at a house party with two years ago is now working in that place and you can message them through the grapevine and they'll connect to you. So to get it noticed, help other people. Once you go through the application process, connect with people who know about the organization. It's a pandemic, nobody's being social, but LinkedIn still works. Don't worry about that. And uh, once you get in, don't burn your bridge. Don't do anything hectic at a Christmas party, uh, but also don't be afraid to be yourself, huh? Because if you aren't, people will see through it. Thank you, Zach. Those are amazing advice <laughs> all the way through. Thank you so much. Um, Carola, for you, the last question. Um, well, I think we have still time, but anyways, um, I saw that you only graduated last year and that you have already been able to secure these impressive jobs at the OHCHR uh, and the UNHCR. And uh, I was wondering what what um, what do you think were the key factors uh, that help you secure these positions so quickly after graduating? Because we have so many students freaking out about not finding a job right away. Um, and especially during uh, this uh, specific and challenging period. Well, first, let me say, I'm sure everybody's thinking about it. What a great time to graduate during a pandemic. Um, that wasn't the plan, of course, but you know, you kind of have to go along with it. I was hit by the first wave during the second semester I was doing my LLM. So it was really live, raw, just like that. Um, and therefore today I would like to share just very like three key factors that I, you know, stance in general, but also during the pandemic became quite crucial um, to me as a student. So first is planning. Um, and when I say planning, I don't say just that, but I say try to plan. 
because the effort is what counts. Uh, so just try to give an effort and try to plan. Uh, you know, the pandemic has taken away many things, but left us with a lot of time. So just use that time well, you know, just go through uh, opportunities that you might be interested in Univa or swear. Think about languages that maybe you want to improve or just like that, you know, online training that you wanted to do for like a very long time and never find time for. Uh, that's really what this extra time could be useful for. And, you know, this is what I kind of did uh, during my second semester. I was thinking about what's next, what could be an opportunity here in Geneva that I could, I could do. And, you know, I reached out to a few graduate institute students that were already doing some internship at the Commissioner for Human Rights, got some information, and I just like finally applied to the special procedure branch. And, you know, I wanted to diversify my CV, get a different experience in another UN organization, get some advocacy oriented work in. And, and that's just what I did. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to see the bigger pictures and to plan around it. But step by step is really the key growing in the UN. Um, second, and Zach, you went very, very well on it, is network. All right, so now network during a pandemic, um, you know, uh, it's already challenging enough to walk up to someone and introduce yourself in person. Never mind sending those cold emails out there trying to make an impression in a few lines. Um, that I found myself quite challenging and also was extremely frustrated and upset that I missed that opportunity to graduate institute to attend those uh, career fair that Joanna was referring about, where you can actually just go there, be yourself, be, be smart, be funny, leave your contact and be contacted. Um, but yet, try to seek opportunities even when it seems there are none. Zach rightly said, um, LinkedIn is still working um, and also your professor, like your professor is still there working. So just like start from like the very like basic send an email to your professor asking about a project that you heard of on an organization you're interested about, or on LinkedIn, reach out to prospective colleagues. You have seen a position, you know that that colleague might be on that position, might be selecting for that position, reach out, send a message, be like, hey, I would like to know more about this position, I'm very interested. This really works. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I would also like to underline, double underline, use any single contact that is given to you during the academic program. Sometimes you just glaze over people and contacts and like classmates, just use any contact of that. Like this is really how it's done in practice. And this is how I got introduced to my current supervisor at UNHC. Mm -hmm. So really use those contacts. And third, timing. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a believer, like a true believer that sometimes it's all about timing. And, you know, time is something that we cannot fully control, uh, but, you know, we must be patient with it. Um, you know, that time, that opportunity, that interview, that call will eventually come. Um, you know, however, I advise students to, like, be as flexible, as open-minded as possible. And most importantly, don't, do not be obsessed with the UN. This is a piece of advice that I got earlier. And... You know, do not be obsessed with the system, you know, because if it doesn't happen at first, it might happen after. Just like, you know, go out there, go in the field, get some experience in the humanitarian sector. You might really end up in place that you, you can never imagine off. And that's still OK. Thank you. I totally share your point of view. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Vani, do you think uh, we have uh, extra time for a last question to all the panelists? Yeah. OK, um, so there is a last question I would like to ask you all is if there are any particular elements uh, of your master or LM, um, that have helped you uh, in your career at the UN. Uh, it could be a capstone project, your thesis, any course that you have taken or any student initiative that you joined. Um, yeah, if you can share that uh, with us, that would be great. Hans, maybe. Thank you. Uh, to think about that, I would say, well, as I mentioned before, I did the MIA, and really what I took away from that was um, this ability to choose your courses across different disciplines. Um, I think that was very helpful. I, I did try to concentrate a bit more on the economic side, 
Um, I was, I, I think um, the courses I really enjoyed were very helpful for me were the trade policy uh, courses offered. Also remember back then it was a bit of a new area, but um, a bit on the economic side of uh, climate change. And um, I think that was also very useful. Uh, and another thing I remember that um, was more of a useful skill to have generally, um, maybe not exactly coming out to get the first job, but um, that definitely was useful for, for my career, was this course we did on negotiations and negotiation skills, um, which was done with a professional that was, um, he was not a professor at HAE, but he was brought in, uh, and I think it was a short course that we did, and I think it was really good, the type of, um, yeah, just the skills you could gain from that. I, I think uh, I benefit a lot from that. Okay, thank you. Um, Joanna? Thank you. I, I would say I tried everything. I, I used all the opportunities that I had in the Institute. So my capstone project was with IOM, not with the division that I'm working mm -hmm. right now with, but still it was organization and I focus and I networking through the capstone. I also use my thesis. My thesis, of course, was focused on migration and the Venezuela migration elements. I use also my um, electives. All my electives were kind of focused in the area that I was interested in. So use every all the opportunities that we have during the master because I have the impression that sometimes we tend to forget how privileged we are that we have the opportunity to focus for two years in just learning and acknowledge and, and have new knowledge and that is incredible so everything that we can use to, to support our career but also just for for honest curiosity and different areas so I use I use all the doors that <laughs> the institute provide me to to, to support my career, but also because I was truly interested in the topic and I'm still there. And it worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it worked. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joanna. Zach? Ultimately, I think it is uh, the process and the feelings you go through to succeed in the Institute, which give you a form of resilience and know-how that lets you keep going forward. Let me give you a couple examples. For anybody that had to come, especially outside of the European Union, communicating with the OPM, getting your visas sorted, the uncertainty of it, hectic. Uh, when you go through master's level programs, I don't care what subject you're in, you're going to sit and counter things you've never understood before with a level of effort to say what's wrong with what they're saying and you still have to figure out what's going on. And then when you chain yourself to a bear and kick that bear, Ella, writing a thesis and hopefully you like it, you probably won't and that's okay. You'll then be faced with the idea that you've committed yourself to an intellectual uh, equivalent of your masterpiece and then you have to figure out where are you going? Not just what, but where because visa expiration dates and how you deal with that uncertainty and how you approach knowledge. That's going to give you a sense of, yeah, I can do it. That, for example, allowed me to go into a job of nutrition and development when I was a war guy before, because I said, okay, well, I can, the Institute helped me understand that I can learn and then you can go with it. And you can have that confidence of saying, come what may, you can weather the strongest gales that the winds can blow and the Institute prepares you for that. The specifics, uh, I will say as an antidote, I wrote my thesis on uh, the role of corruption in Mexican organized crime. And in a personal level, it's been quite interesting to see things that I that I found in 2014 and 15 playing out today. But uh, rather than the knowledge you gain, the process of acquiring knowledge through the Institute is what carries you. Okay, very interesting. Thank you, Zach. And Carola, would you like to share your experience as well? Um, as far as particular elements of my personal experience on the LLM program, I would definitely say uh, the legal clinic project that we had mm -hmm. in the second semester. I'm not sure whether that applies to also the master programs, but anyway, it was a project mm -hmm. with UNACR as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the project was actually on the impact of UNACR engagement with the universal period periodic review, which I'm sure mm -hmm. human rights people will know what I'm talking about um, and uh, the impact on the human rights of refugee or the person of concern. Um, aside that the project was super interesting, that really um, gave me the chance to connect with a unit in UNACR headquarters, which, you know, never give us a given. Um, 
So like through that project, even though we started in December in person, we meet at the office, UACR, it was amazing. And then in the second semester, that all went away. Uh, but still the project was like super, super beneficial because I kept those contact, the, the work, they appreciated the work. And even though after they couldn't offer um, a paid internship because the UNACR, some units can offer paid internships of other units, unfortunately are not allowed to. Uh, that still was a contact that when I applied to other internship, I put as a reference. And you know, a okay. reference coming from a colleague that maybe works next door <laughs> at the office can be extremely beneficial um, to get started in the system. So yeah, I would say that experience was definitely uh, the most beneficial. And of course, as Zach said, um, I think the Graduate Institute really prepare you for war. Um, the, the level of engagement and um, materials to study and stress that I was put through the LLM. Um, at the time, I, I didn't know, <laughs> I hated it, but then now um, I'm, I'm very, very uh, glad that I, I got put through that traumatic, a bit of traumatic experience because okay. you get to the work, uh, to the work experience, I can be, yeah, can be quite similar. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all for all those advice. Uh, they were amazing. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to hear that. Actually, uh, we can make uh, we can use any any elements of your programs um, to to become a, um, where you are today. So it's very good to know. Thank you again, everyone. It was nice meeting you. Wonderful meeting you too. Thank you, Karine. Thank you. Yes, so thank you to all of you. So I have plenty of questions over there. Uh, it's real that we are really close to 100 people online. Um, so I think we cannot answer to all the questions. As I have the floor, I will just uh, remind you that we are 20,000 alumni around the world and that there is 70 representations uh, in different countries, etc. And so we are here with Zaninka, with Clementine and myself to give you a hand. If you want to get in touch with alumni, we can do the search together. Um, so please feel free to, to reach us. Uh, and, and probably at the end or during the questions, I'll uh, give the floor to all of the people online so we can all see each other. And this is the start of, uh, of the network. Um, so, the 1st question uh, is uh, from uh, Santiago. Is there any difference having a PhD to work in 1 of the organs of the UN in Geneva? Who wants to take this 1? Hans, do you feel at ease with this 1 or. Um, well. I'll let anyone step in once again. Uh, what I've seen at least, um, normally the masters is uh, what they're looking for, at least for the entry level. I don't think you, will, you need, they will require a PhD for an entry level position, which is probably looking for. Obviously, being a PhD um, is an advantage. Um, it's a desirable, usually. So you, you, if if you have the PhD and you're you're competing against people with masters, and obviously the PhD you've done is uh, related closely to the, the field of work they're doing. I think you'll have advantage of that, but I wouldn't say it's necessary, especially at, at this level. Who else? Someone yeah. else? Or could yeah. I, if I go could ahead, just Joanna. Add, thank you. If I could just add, I think uh, well, depending a lot in what you would like to be doing. If you're really into research and you want to work in it, then probably the PhD is a good way forward. But if you want to have the knowledge and the experience to also for the field that is as important as to do a PhD. So I think it's a trade off that all of us at some point have to do if we want to continue into the academia work and more focus in publishing, then maybe the PhD is the right way. But in the UN system, at least in my experience in IOM with a master degree, it's, it's perfect. You're perfect, capable to continue growing up. Um, but yeah, probably then the field experience is that other element. I would be happy to chime in and say there are organizations such as the World Bank or perhaps the FAO where it would be who you to have that. The I, yeah, IMF especially. Outside of that, um, it is true that contractually a master's or PhD is of the same level. 
if your PhD is specific to a job, you may get a year or two extra experience, but traditionally that is not uh, how it works. So a master is your qualifying feature. You often need that. And then anything above that uh, for specific things are necessary, but usually no. Carola, would you like to add something to this or not? I think everything important was said. Uh, uh, PhD, I mean, for what I was told also before, um, PhD, um, as far as in the legal sector, might mean more than an actual national qualification as lawyer. Um, that was always my, my question. And I guess a PhD would be a great alternative um, instead of pursuing um, the, the, the formal qualification. Uh, as far as the public international law uh, word is concerned. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so here I have a question from uh, Ibrahim. I think, well, in my opinion, Johanna answered uh, already for a, for a part of it. Um, so are the internships remunerated uh, in your respective times at the UN? If not, would a student on a tight budget be better placed to take a paid non-UN internship? Who wants to take this one at first? I, I could start um, I think, yeah, my colleagues will continue and, and could also uh, add elements if I forget. But um, I think well, right now the UN system is really trying to pay a lot of the internship. Um, Unfortunately, it wasn't the case when, for example, I did my internship with OHHR. I think it, it continues to be the case that is not paid. In my case, it was a personal promise to do an unpaid internship for only three months I, because I, I knew that I couldn't afford to, to be in Geneva without that. Again, I was fortunate enough that I had the, the, the scholarship, so I could still uh, kind of balance those two and the internship you have some credits in the institute like the three credits I took it from there so I kind of assume okay that is my pay um, in the case of IOM they pay you it's not a super high salary but it still is a good entry point um, and I think other UN organizations as well I, I heard that ILO for example is one of the the best one I think the other element here will be to understand if in that organization you really see yourself for the future and the long term so it's maybe worth it to be three or six months on unpaid interest, but it's because you really want to be there and you know that that is going to be your future. If not, then maybe look for more paid internships or other kind of works as well in the Institute. They could also help a lot. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, maybe I yeah. Carry yeah, Carola and then Zach. Um, well, I also have uh, quite extensive experience, I guess, uh, with internship. Uh, but so when I started my first internship at UNHCR in Rome, I was the first ever paid intern in the system. And I mean, in Rome for sure. Uh, and I mean, yeah, it wasn't a lot, but that allowed me to actually take on almost an eight months uh, internship living in Rome and uh, trying to like pay my bills. Um, so that, that was a positive, but then, um, um, the, the high commission for human rights still has this big problem of unpaid internship. And I do understand that in Geneva, uh, that organization, you know, provides a very significant number of internship and uh, is a great way to networking. Um, yet, you know, I have to say, do it if you can, but do not overstay. <laughs> Do not overstay in those internship because um, unfortunately the work requirements for entry position in the UN are set quite high. Uh, but at the same time, if you get a master degree and one internship experience, you can try to aim for a trainship or a fellowship or similar agreements, even in the NGO sector. Um, get there, get some get, get some experience if you can. Um, you know, I, I will not go into the discourse of unpaid internship. We all know, um, you know, the inequality and justice that comes along with it. Uh, I think there are steps uh, that it's moving forward to like change. Even at the High Commission for Human Rights, I've heard some positive uh, updates on creating some like programs that will be paid. And lastly, I would also say, as Joanna uh, mentioned, make sure when you do an internship that then there is an after, uh, because in some organization, uh, it's not really easy to get uh, that contract after. 
Uh, for example, the high commissioner, everybody knows there is a, a policy of a six months break after you take an internship, then after that you might be uh, applying to normal position or for consultancy. But even the normal position, be aware, <laughs> because in, in, in the UN Secretariat there is, for example, the national quota. I know for a fact because I'm Italian. And, you know, the only channels through is through the YPP or a JPO. And so make sure that you know which cards you can play because overstaying in those internships without them uh, having a, a real like opportunity to get in the organization doesn't really make um, much sense to me. Thank you. Um, Zach, would you like to say something or I go ahead? I I would go for 20 seconds. Um, some organizations, uh, an unpaid internship is the excellent foot in the door. You can consider the ILO to be a staple of that. IOM is also very good. There are some that just use internships as a, we can have three interns per year and it's a conveyor belt and you need to understand that beforehand. Do the networking piece, have some real chats with people before you get in to have an understanding whether it's going to be something or not. Often when you know that you're not going to get a job out of it, it's still a good opportunity to then go somewhere else. Thank you. Um, well, please open your cameras because I will open the floor uh, to, to everyone. Probably this question from Josh uh, is more for uh, Aline uh, because uh, Josh will start uh, his master's degree at the Institute uh, in uh, International Re Political uh, international relations, political science in September. And he's wondering uh, if it is a wise decision to already apply for internships in the first semester. So maybe you can say a word on, on, on that, uh, Aline, thank you. So before answering that question, I need to know where he's from. Yeah, so answer for both. So everyone on, on, on online uh, would be covered. Exactly. Um, so when you come in Switzerland um, and if you're not uh, an EU citizen, you cannot work the first six months. So, so that might answer your question. Um, if you are uh, a European citizen or a Swiss, which I doubt, um, then you can start, um, but depending on um, your courses, it can be challenging to have an internship in the first semester, from what I understand from the students. Uh, yeah, and I see some people are nodding. <laughs> so, it's not impossible, but it's not highly recommended because also settling in takes time to understand also the, the whole, um, um, as uh, Zach was saying, you know, understand the, the institute, how it works, etc. and and um, be at ease with your courses, etc. It's probably not uh, the best time to start an internship. At least wait a couple of months to see how it goes for you. I mean, uh, the workload, because some students are really surprised by the workload um, well, so the first semester. Especially yeah. with MRFs, it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> not that others aren't, but MRFs, uh, certainly. <laughs> So, so yes, so this covers the questions of Ruth, uh, who was asking, did you do your internships during the semester or did you wait for the break between semesters at IHEID? So I think this is more or less covered. So it, it depends on people. Joanna, yeah, go ahead. I, I could add, I did, I, I did both in fact. I did one internship while I was in the break and uh, the internship with IOM was while I was writing my thesis, which is not also very recommended unless you really want to be in that organization. But I did it in the last two months of the of the thesis, so both ways work. Thank you. Uh, I have here a, a comment and a question from uh, Victoria uh, to Zach. I really appreciated your realism in terms of communication transferable skills. Do you suggest one specific strategy that worked most for you. Thanks a lot. I'd love to give you a 30 second pitch. No matter the job, they're looking for a duck and you need to say, I quack, 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 just like a duck. How you do that, check the organization, their mandate, what the division wants to do, and then you write how you can do that. Your interview stage through your networking and preparing, you'll be able to accentuate the transferable skills. 
But I want you to look at your skills as a continuum. A weakness arises where a strength stops and your strengths can be found in weaknesses. What does that really mean? Well, consider volunteering. There is internships that are unpaid, very different from volunteering. For the last five years, I've used volunteering to get my public speaking skills better by supporting teams in public speaking. Uh, and I've used, I'm horrible at communications. So I volunteered to write comms pieces for organizations so I get better at it. They're not paying me, so I'm not heartbroken when they give me corrective uh, criticism. But think of volunteering as a really cool way of getting real supporting experience to either make a skill better or make something not as bad as it was. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question. I have plenty of questions. Sorry. Uh, so probably it will be the one of the last one from Rafaela, maybe to maybe to Joanna. Uh, she would like to have some tips for someone applying for IOM. Okay, my tips for IOM will be, I think they're in fact quite general, but really know which is the area that you would like to apply. So make a tiny research in the website of the different divisions beforehand, before doing your motivation letter and try to connect the dots. So while you're a student, like it's true what SAC says that you don't need to be a specialist all the time, but it still it's good to connect your motivation, your personal background with what you're interested in work and kill it in, in the motivation letter. And I'm sure they, they will call you for the first round. Thank you. Uh, I have another question here. Is there someone online who would like to to ask the question him or herself? Just raise your hand if you want. This is the opportunity to network also in real in real life. Um, so a question from Damien. I know from experience that many interns at the World Food Program, so it means in Rome, get hired after going to tough countries, offices like uh, South Sudan, GRC, etc. at the end of their internships at the HQ in, your, in Rome. Is it the same in your agency or can you get promoted as easily from an internship to a real job while staying in Geneva or elsewhere? Oh, so would, who would like to take this one? Take this one, Karin. Um, I can speak from the UNDP. Um, well, UNDP has our country offices in 170 countries and territories, so they really have widespread. And I think um, what, what, what the question is um, pointing to uh, can be looked can be looked at from a different perspective, and it's the following: the HQ and, for example, Geneva, especially, are very desirable positions. So people that have more experience. Um, they tend to gravitate towards those, and there's, there's just more competition. I think there's less competition working in this um, field offices, but particularly with their uh, dangerous offices, you, you think that some of them are not for family uh, posts, for example. So then you would, uh, let's, let's say, there's less competition uh, to apply to those, so you're probably more likely to get a first chance working in, in the field offices, and if they're in one of the complex zones or, or places that people maybe will not like to go. People have more experience or work more, will not like to go. So um, that that's, makes it extra challenging sometimes. This is that I'm generalizing, there might be exceptions, but generally speaking, it, it is more difficult to uh, start in Geneva and do your whole career in Geneva. I think even within the UN and most organizations, um, they're really now pushing to have this rotation, the geographical rotation of people because they, they, they know also that it's detrimental to, be, to people's careers and the organization. They want to get uh, fresh people, new ideas. So more and more, I think you'll see that uh, your organizations will require for you to keep ascending on that, on that um, as you go as a professional, to have this uh, lateral move or, or to have this geographical move. Joanna, yeah. No, if I could just add, um, just to be careful with the, with the different posts um, when, when you apply also for the field, if you want to apply as an international staff or as a national staff, because that um, is different. But, um, but it, there's always, there's no one way to go to Rome. So even I started at Geneva, there are some people, including myself, that I continue, I did my internship, then I did a consultancy, and now I'm a staff. So it's possible, but yeah, I also would like to go to to go back to, to Latin America, so <laughs> it is possible too. Could I jump in very quickly? Yeah, go ahead, Zach, please. Um, you will generally, generally be a lone wolf as an international civil servant, making your way transitioning. 
I have been in Geneva. It's the ivory tower. Nothing goes wrong, but I do go on missions all the time. The hardest place I've been sent to was the Khyber Pass and the tribal areas between Afghanistan and Pakistan for three weeks. What you need to understand is that hard places, the hard, the L2, L3s, if you go there as an intern or as an individual contractor, you need to understand this is not a joke and security is a very serious thing that you will not have. So you need to be very conscious of where you're going uh, and make sure that um, you do not find yourself in a bad situation. Uh, even as a staff member, you don't have complete protections in some places. Uh, whereas an intern, you need to be very safe. I just want to tell you that because no one else is looking out for you. It's true. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Carola. Thank you, Aline. Thank you, Zani. Thank you to all of you for being here today. Uh, Zani, I give you the floor back and uh, hopefully see you very soon and in September for the new admitted students. Thank you. Yes, I, I would also just say thank you so much for being great panelists and really ending Inspire students of this um, academic year on a really high note. Thank you everyone for turning your cameras on. Uh, you will be, this recording will be available for those who couldn't join. And again, networking, LinkedIn is still alive. You can find them all on LinkedIn. You can see their names, so I'm sure they'll be happy to connect with you. Um, feel free to email us if you have any questions. We'll send out our survey soon, looking at future topics for future Inspire students. So keep an eye out for that. And that's it for me. Thank you so much again. You. Thank you for organizing this amazing event. Thank you. Thanks to you for being here.